We are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserves uh, Sci Cafe series. Um, thank you for joining us today. This series is a platform uh, for residents and scientists uh, to talk about the science being conducted in the area uh, in an informal and casual setting. It brings residents and scientists together to explore different topics. Our program will be about 45 minutes to an hour in length um, and plenty of time for questions afterwards. You can put questions in the questions box or you can raise your hand. Um, today we welcome Dr. Rebecca Doolin and she's gonna talk about biodiversity on the Forgotten Coast uh, from Chapman and, and beyond. The Eastern Florida Panhandle um, is an internationally recognized hotspot for biodiversity. And she's a homeowner here, retired director of the Frazier Herbarium at Butler University up in Indianapolis. And she's going to discuss factors responsible for this amazing concentration of plants and animals with a focus uh, on the incredible flora of the area. So, Rebecca, take it away. Hey, thank you, Anita, and hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, I'm excited to be here and, and share uh, this fascinating information about our biodiversity of our area. But first, I'm going to start with a disclaimer, which is that I am no expert on the bio biodiversity of the Forgotten Coast. Uh, I am a longtime student of natural history, and I'm very interested in this area and have been for a while, but I've never conducted any research here myself, but I've tried to compile uh, information to share with you, and that's been provided by experts. So overview of the talk. First of all, when I chose the title, uh, forgot, put Forgotten Coast in the title, I was interested in reminding myself exactly what uh, was meant by the Forgotten Coast and the origin of that um, moniker for our area. Then I want to share some information about why it's considered part of a biodiversity hotspot, largely based on endemic species, and I'll be talking about those and then broaden the scope a little bit to talk about all species in our area and then share more about how you can learn more. This is the Chapman and beyond part. And I do have to uh, say that um, we're not gonna be seeing a lot of pictures of cool plants and animals. It's going to be more of a high level talk, like 30,000 feet looking down at our area to understand the diversity that's here. So we're going to see some maps, some websites. So first of all, when I started thinking about giving this talk, like I said, I wanted to remember what is the Forgotten Coast. So one of the first sites that came up when I searched on this was this kind of funny blog from 2015 that says, have you ever visited Panacea, Sop Choppy, or Apalachicola? It's OK. No one else has either. The, this is the part they call the Florida's Forgotten Coast, the one rarely visited by humans. So those of you who've been here over the past couple of years probably know that uh, it's now uh, visited by humans a fair bit. And all of the coasts of Florida have been given well, nicknames to uh, attract, help attract tourists. And when you go to that authoritative site, Wikipedia, to find out about the origin of the Forgotten Coast, can see that it refers to a largely untouched and uninhabited area of the coastline in the panhandle. Okay. It was trademarked, first used in 1992, uh, trademarked by the Apalachicola Bay Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Anita. And this area commonly refers to the relatively quiet and undeveloped, largely uninhabited again, section of the coastline stretching from Mexico Beach to St. Mark's. If you go to the um, Tourist Development Council's website, there's more information about the Forgotten Coast. It's nestled in the panhandle. Beautiful region has been dubbed the Forgotten Coast, they say, because it's the last remaining stretch of unspoiled, pristine Gulf Coast beaches that haven't been overrun by high rises and strip malls. And that's definitely true. 
The story that I had heard about the origin of the name, though, was because it had been left off of a state of Florida map once. And I managed to find this map online. I don't know if this was the map or not, but you can see that uh, there are no cities mentioned from Panama City all along the coast until you get down to about Tampa. There's also uh, a bit of debate about what exactly uh, counties that should be included in the panhandle. So this is another map again from Wikipedia. And this reminds me of uh, the interesting fact that, or funny to me anyway, that so I'm from, worked most of my life in the Midwest and still have a house in Indiana. And when I mentioned to people that my husband and I have a house on the Florida Panhandle, you would be amazed by the number of people who have said, oh, on the Gulf or the Atlantic. So clearly the Florida Panhandle is on the Gulf. Most of my talk is gonna zero in on a particular part of the Forgotten Coast that is Franklin County and adjacent counties. And you can see that there are actually some cities in Franklin County, as we know on this map, seeing uh, Apalachicola in East Point and Carabell. And uh, this reminds me to mention that it is not uninhabited, but there is a low population uh, in the county of uh, fewer than 12,000 people. The amazing thing to me that I discovered when I started reading about this area, and I knew that there were a lot of um, endemic species locally, but in researching talks that I've given recently, I found that our area of Florida has been identified by many groups as a global biodiversity hotspot. You can see here Conservation International as uh, one prong of their conservation efforts has identified biodiversity hotspots around the globe. And one of them is covers the um, Gulf Coast and Atlantic Coast coastal plain regions. So the Forgotten Coast is part of an internationally recognized biodiversity hotspot. So uh, what is biodiversity? Well, it's all the kinds of animals, all the kinds of life that you will find in one area. The variety of animals, plants, fungi, and microorganisms that make up the ecosystems. Conservation International describes biodiversity hotspots. To qualify as a biodiversity hotspot, a region must meet two strict criteria. It must have at least 1,500 vascular plants as endemics. And endemic species are those that are found nowhere else on the planet, species with a very narrow um, geographic range. Okay, so since, those, since it's made up of many species that occur nowhere else, it is an irreplaceable uh, part of our earth. And they also have a criterion that from their perspectives, it has to be threatened in some way and have 30% or less of its original natural vegetation. So why would they focus on endemics? That is species that have a, a limited geographic range. Okay? Well, it's because small range size is often thought to be one of the best predictors of extinction risk. So you have to preserve the plants in the place they are because they're only in that one place. Okay? Well, why focus on plants? Well, plants are the base of the food web and they also provide you know, habitat for the critters. So in their analysis, Conservation International has determined or estimated that their hotspots, which cover only 2.5% of the Earth's surface, are, provide us with 35% of Earth's ecosystem services. They house 50% of the world's endemic plants and more than 40% of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians are found just within these biodiversity hotspots. So they're among the richest and most important ecosystems in the world, right here. So uh, the high levels of biodiversity along the uh, panhandle have been identified uh, for quite a while. Some of the earliest work that I've come across was done in 
the year 2000 by the Nature Conservancy and NatureServe. And in this sort of heat map, you can see they show a high concentration of um, important uh, endemic species in the panhandle. And at that time, they'd identified four animals and seven plant species that weren't found anywhere else, and additional rare species, uh, 34 animals and 16 plants right in this area. So since I'm not an expert in the biodiversity of this area, I can quote experts, though. And there was an uh, excellent paper published in the journal Bioscience in 2008. And here are a couple of quotes from that paper, one from Deborah Keller with the Nature Conservancy, who clarifies why the panel, why the panel, why the panhandle is a biodiversity hotspot. Its rivers run clean, its coastal estuaries and forests are productive. It has changed more slowly than peninsular Florida. So species and natural ecosystems have survived. Ecologist Bruce Means, who's also a herpetologist, who's at uh, Florida State, points out that no area of its size in the United States or Canada has more species of frogs, snakes, and it ranks about third in the world for turtles. Diversity of salamanders, birds, and plants is also high. All this is a reflection of the high habitat diversity of the Florida Panhandle. So the Florida Plan Handle has many rich and dramatic habitats. For example, seepage bogs contain colorful arrays of carnivorous plants in communities that can rival rainforests in diversity with more than 50 species of plants per square meter by some estimates. So these are um, amazing and impressive uh, statistics uh, right in our area. So, that paper was in 2008. People have continued to identify the panhandle as an area of uh, biodiversity and an area, and I'll explain uh, why this is thought, uh, that needs additional conservation focus. And this paper published in the Proceeding of the National Academy of Science in 2015, uh, looked just at the United States, continental United States, and they compiled range maps for terrestrial vertebrates, freshwater fish, and trees, choosing these taxa because they believed that they were ones for whom the total distribution was really well known across the continental United States. So they mapped these species to see where the high concentrations of endemics were. And again, the panhandle, which score, which is number five on this chart, Florida panhandle, scores a really hot, dark color on this heat map of having more than 27 yeah. endemic species. And the most important groups coming out in their analysis were trees, uh, fish, and reptiles in this area. But you can see that it's kind of second only to uh, some areas of Southern California, and a little bit uh, up in the Appalachians. In a paper published uh, two years ago in Ecological Applications, again, you can see the bright yellow colors in the panhandle identifying this as areas of you know, unprotected uh, biological diversity importance. And as recently as last year, the New York Times picked up on uh, this research and again shows a uh, dark color concentration in uh, the panhandle that's uh, very similar to uh, areas um, that are very um, dark red and maroon in um, Southern California as areas of high um, concentration of imperiled biodiversity. Another way to think about uh, rare species is not to focus solely on ones with a very small geographic range, that is those that are endemic, but it's also to uh, consider those that have uh, are protected by the Endangered Species Act. So therefore, they're considered to be in danger of extinction. And sometimes this can be species with a, a overall broader geographic range, but maybe scattered uh, and few or low number of individuals in populations. 
So when we look again, I'll zero in on this map a little closer. We can see again, this analysis identifies the panhandle as an area with a high number of imperiled vascular plants. Another study that kind of makes the same point, but uh, focuses on just the southeastern United States was published in 2001. And this analysis looked at distributions of endemic species in the southeast. And the little isobars indicate uh, high numbers of uh, endemic species. And Florida is um, like, ground zero for the endemic species uh, in the Southeast, many of them along the central uh, peninsular ridge, the Lake Wales Ridge in Florida. And I have done some studies with plants there, but it's really surpassed by the concentration of endemic species uh, in the panhandle. And so the AFP on the map here is the uh, Apalachicola region of the Florida panhandle. And in their article, they said, in the second paragraph here, the highest concentrations of endemics in this region is manifest in Liberty and Franklin counties. Franklin County contains 53 rare southeastern endemics, whereas Liberty County holds 55. And together, these two counties contain 74 different endemic species. Thus, almost 20% of all rare southeastern endemics have at least one occurrence in either of these counties. And so this is plants. So the Forgotten Coast region has lots of endemics, but also there are lots of species with uh, wider geographic ranges. So in the talk so far, we've been talking about rare plants, plants with really restricted um, distributions, but there are also plants that are from, uh, that have a that are rare that are in our area that also add to the overall biodiversity. So I'm going to use that map we were looking at before to explain um, where some of these species came from and why there's such a high total number of species, not just endemics, but species overall uh, in our area. And one is the red arrow coming down from the north. A lot of species, not I mean, a lot, some of the species reach their so the in the southern edge of their distributions right in the Florida panhandle area. That is, there are species with Appalachian affinities that uh, perhaps by being connected uh, via the Apalachicola River and uh, are species with more northern affinities like beaches and um, spring beauty and uh, other spring ephemerals that occur in some of the northern counties of the Florida panhandle, uh, and that's as far south as they get. The same sort of uh, story occurs for species that are mostly of a more tropical origin that uh, migrated into our area via the Florida peninsula that reach the northern edge of their range distributions uh, here in the panhandle. There are species from the Atlantic coastal plain that are part of our flora, as well as, and this is the one that's most surprising to me, there's a fair number of species uh, in our flora that are elements of the flora of the semi-arid um, southwest. And they, uh, reach their eastern range distributions here. So I'll explain in a bit how some geological history has allowed these species in, and then the current geology and elevation allows them to stay. So these uh, focused mostly on plants uh, and in that prior slide. And here's a map from the uh, book, wonderful book, Ecosystems of Florida, which shows and what I want you to concentrate on here is if you look at where you see the letter B, that uh, uncolored area of the map shows the current coastline. And then the stippled area along the outside is the, the estimated shoreline uh, during the Wisconsin glaciation about 20,000 years ago. 
So during a period of glaciation, uh, a lot of seawater is tied up in glaciers. So sea level uh, falls and more of the um, shoreline is exposed. And so at that time, as you can see in the west on this map, there was um, more of a connection to the flora of Texas and the southeast to provide a, a migration corridor for plants. The same sort of um, phenomenon has been recorded again here by um, Bruce Means uh, for amphibians and reptiles. So this table shows the geographic affinities, the sort of uh, origins of Apalachicola drainage amphibians and reptiles. And you can see that some are kind of species of more northern affinity. Their uh, ranges are more in the north. There are some from the Atlantic and Gulf coastal plain. It's more widespread species, uh, coastal plains in general. A few have uh, more uh, of their range in the peninsular Florida. Some are widespread Eastern US species and a few are the strict endemics to the area. So this pattern that I was describing for plants also exists or many animals and contributes, you know, or helps explain why there's a, a high uh, diversity overall of species, not just rare species in our area. Another factor that I wanted to bring in was that uh, in most of these cases, well, in the previous cases I was talking about, I was talking about species that uh, reside uh, their whole time in uh, area of the Forgotten Coast, but there are also species that migrate through that add to seasonal uh, diversity in our area. For example, uh, there are a number of birds that are neotropical migrants and on their uh, seasonal trips north and south, they will travel over the panhandle like the gorgeous scarlet tanager. Other migrants, and these are also uh, some full-time residents, uh, include the, if you've been here in October, you've seen the amazing display of migrating monarch butterflies. And I was kind of curious when I came across this chart on uh, Monarch Watch, which seems to suggest maybe they were reading the same Florida map that had us as the Forgotten Coast because it doesn't show them migrating uh, directly over our area. But then it's based on, um, recovered tagged plants. Maybe that reflects a little bit the low human population density for uh, retrieving and reporting um, the tagged plants. Yeah. So I'm gonna shift focus just a little bit now and talk about why although a lot of Franklin County is in uh, public lands, it's still part of an area that is identified as, you know, at risk because uh, there um, is low amount of conservation land. So I think this can be explained by considering uh, the difference between what's public land and what's strictly conservation land. So I had heard the statistic that 90% of Franklin County was in public lands. And so my friend Scott Davis helped me find this site, direct me to this site on the Florida Natural Areas Inventory website that shows ownership of land. And you can see that uh, most of the Franklin County area is uh, in state or federal land ownership. And you can, we can zero in a little bit more and see that this is uh, a lot of Tate's Hell State Forest, a little bit of Apalachicola National Forest, and uh, uh, areas in the bay land managed by the NUR. But and the what on this map looks a little bit like it might be more water. Some of these spots, when we look up here, we can see that that is the 10% that is big chunks of private land. You can see Apalachicola, that kind of white X is the airport. And then you can see uh, East Point over to Carabell. So, so there is a lot of land that is publicly owned in Franklin County. But I think when people have been doing these analysis of at-risk uh, species and the need for more protection, they consider 
the uh, national forests, state forests, you know, as working lands that aren't dedicated uh, strictly to the conservation of the rare species there. But of course, they are under, you know, some protection from development, and there are uh, management staff and practices and uh, focus on species of concern in these sites, but it's not their main reason uh, for being there. And I think in Franklin County, a lot of this area is, is um, zoned for agriculture, and uh, that's what the main function, I believe, of the, the state forests is. I was going to give a shout out to our sponsors here. This is a little bit blurry map, but this is an uh, area uh, up along the um, banks of the Apalachicola River that are managed uh, and are under good, you know, primary conservation practices uh, by the uh, Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve. Another way to look at uh, the county is not to just look at ownership of the land, but you can find out the land cover. And this is a, an interesting site that shows us kind of what we already knew, that most of the county is covered by trees. But as we already know, from what I just said before, it's not just all piney woods. There are a lot of rare um, plants and animals contained within the forested treed areas. This website has a cool feature, which doesn't show you as much in our area as it might in some other parts of the country. But you can see kind of on the lower left there, there's a little slider bar and you can look at how uh, land use and cover has changed uh, over the last five years. And I hadn't changed that much in our area. So although most of the county, as we just saw in that last slide, is uh, forested, there are different kinds of forest present. And you can see that in this uh, map of the general vegetation types that the county is mostly number two here, pine flatwoods, and number eight, down the bottom, swamp forests. So I'm going to do another little segue or no, move to another section in the talk. And this one uh, tells the story of how we learned and how we continue to learn about uh, details of the flora of our area. The earliest botanical explorer who uh, documented the incredible diversity of flora that I've just been speaking about in our area was Dr. Alvin Chapman. He was an Apalachicola resident serving as a physician uh, through much of the 1800s. And this is a time when Apalachicola was really a frontier area and it's remarkable. And I've given a couple of talks about his uh, career uh, because he's uh, amazingly impressive to me that he was able to explore and document so much uh, working uh, at such an early time. And he was not trained professionally as a botanist. Uh, he took this on as a hobby and later corresponded with uh, all of the best botanists in the United States at the time who were in uh, at Harvard or in the Northeast. And he was able to produce, uh, with their help some, a uh, volume, a book of the flora of uh, the Southern United States. It was the first comprehensive treatment of the flora written in um, 1860. And it had uh, descriptions of the species uh, so that you could learn to tell them apart. And through his work, Chapman named as new to science more than 400 species of plants, in part because he was exploring this area that had not been uh, potentially explored much before, and that there are so many endemic species here. And then uh, also uh, others have named plants in his honor. So I think Chapman was able to produce this work, which stood until 
the 1930s as the authoritative volume on the uh, flora of our area. Now, if you wanted to learn about plants, I think Chapman would be like totally amazed by this technology. Uh, information uh, provided in his book and other sources have now been compiled, and of course, you can search them on the internet. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of what I think are the best sites, my favorite sites. Uh, one is the Atlas of Florida Plants. So when I wanted to, to drill down and learn more about all of the plants that are found in our area, I went here. And you can devise your search to cover just certain parts of Florida. So I searched on, you can see the pink rectangle up there. The um, county, I chose Franklin County, and it lists in alphabetical order by scientific name, the 1,679 plants that are thought to grow in Franklin County. And uh, from those data, I was able to compile this table, which uh, shows that those 1,600 and 79 plant species known from Franklin County account for about 34% of all of the species known to grow in Florida. And these are all plants, natives, non-natives, uh, ferns, uh, I believe it even includes mosses, all known um, plant species. And if we widen the scope a little bit and look at the uh, adjacent counties of Liberty and Gulf, then we get up to almost half the species that are known for the entire state of Florida are found uh, in these three counties. So then I started to think, well, all right, let's compare that to some, some other county that, that is well known in Florida. So I chose Miami-Dade, and there, there are uh, just a little over 1,900 species known. So that's a little more than Franklin County. But then you got to consider that there's a big difference in the geographic area, the size and area of those counties. Franklin is the 57th out of 67 counties in Florida in terms of size. So it's small, right? It's 25% smaller than Miami-Dade. So this is just another way of thinking about the concentration of, of biodiversity that can be found in our area. Another website, that is based out of the University of Florida, compiles records not based on, on known distributions, but based on actual specimens that have been collected and deposited in museums to document the distribution of species. And here, if you search on Franklin County, you can pull up a map and it will tell you where a plant or animal specimen that is housed in a collection somewhere in the world uh, has been collected. And here I just drilled down into the plants. And here, if we uh, look at these dots, they indicate a plant that is in a plant museum. They're known as herbaria. There, there's an actual specimen that's been collected in these areas. I'll show you how that works. Uh, you can punch on a button, a button, punch on a, a dot, and pull up what the plant is. And in this case, it was a specimen of Paranichia baldwinii, Baldwin's nail wart. It's not a, a, a pretty or really well known plant, but it was found right here in um, our area. And if you Click on it, you can get more information about that particular collection. And here we find that it was collected by Lauren Anderson, uh, excellent field botanist from Florida State who recently passed away, who over the decades did an amazing amount of botanizing and collecting uh, along the Forgotten Coast. His specimen that he collected to his voucher to document this location for this paranichia is housed in the herbarium at Florida State University. And if you click again on this website, you can see an image of that herbarium specimen. It's a Preston dried plant collected by Anderson in the field. 
And these specimens are usually collected at a time when the plants are in flower or fruit or have important identifying features available. Try to get the whole plant, like the root you can see here. It might be that some species have tap roots or fibrous roots versus fibrous roots, and that might be important for telling them apart. The idea is that with this record, it's not just I'm sure he was correct, but it's not just that Anderson said, oh, I saw that plant there. It's here is the plant that Anderson saw. So if people have questions about the identification, uh, perhaps it was collected by a less uh, well-known botanist, uh, you can go back and look at the exact same plant. They are pressed and dried carefully, mounted onto paper, and filed in cabinets, kind of like books in a library, and they can be retrieved and over the last couple of decades have been being imaged so that you don't have to go to the collection to see it, you can see it online. But one of the most important features of these uh, herbarium uh, specimens is the label in the lower right-hand corner. This is what makes the plant specimen valuable because it documents where it was collected and when. So when we compile all this information, we can know where plants are found and when they were found there. So a standard herbarium label will have where it was collected. You can see here, it'll have the scientific name of the plant. It'll have a collector. And in this case, this was the 9,522nd uh, specimen that uh, Lauren collected. And he probably has field notes that you could look up on that like notebooks that he brought with him and you could look up that number and find out like what else was growing uh, in the same area or what did he collect that day because they're usually numbered you know sequentially it has the date when it was collected so assuming that this plant was in flower we know that in 1986 it flowered in june 5th early june so uh herbarium records are being studied now to look for like signatures of climate change to see if the phenology is changing, if plants are blooming earlier or, uh, or potentially later than, than they used to. We have a record now of uh, that we can compare it to. Other piece of information on herbarium labels, and, uh, I used to you know, manage a herbarium, so I'm happy I'm talking about uh, these incredible collections. One more thing is that it has the uh, location and the habitat where the plant was collected. And sometimes it'll indicate uh, whether it was common or rare or whatever. In this case, uh, Dr. Anderson has indicated that it, it was frequent, meaning he saw, saw it a lot. It was in moist, sandy loam of grassy roadsides. So, uh, and it tells the exact location near Cache Creek Bridge. So it would be easy to go back and locate this. Nowadays, people will also have, you know, GPS coordinates, which makes it easy to locate too. But it used to be that people, you know, used more descriptors like this. Uh, having information about the habitat is helpful in case this roadside had been, um, the road had been re rebuilt and the roadside expanded. Maybe that uh, grassy depression isn't there anymore, but if you wanted to find this plant, and it's frequent, you could probably find it in another grassy depression close by. So those are important ways in which we learn what uh, is growing where. And we do have still herbarium specimens that were collected by Dr. Chapman. And if they are stored and preserved properly, they will last for centuries if they've been mounted on uh, the kind of paper that will survive that long, the plant material really well if it hasn't been exposed to light or moisture uh, that could, or insects that would um, degrade it. Other good places to learn about uh, our, the natural history of our area include the Florida Native Plant Society. If you wanted to learn more details about the kinds of plant communities that occur in our areas, uh, they have good descriptors. You can download a guide to the natural communities of Florida from the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. The Florida Natural Areas Inventory also allows you to search by county 
for records of rare plants and animals. Now they just tell you here that it's present, a plant or animal is that's rare is present in an area, it doesn't give you location so that the um, there isn't a conservation threat to these species. But if you search on like Franklin County, it'll give you uh, all of the plants and animals that have some kind of protected status that are listed and followed by them. So here I'm just highlighting the amphibians from um, Franklin County. And I find these kind of lists helpful because if you found something and you're trying to identify it, uh, it gives you a more narrow list of what it's likely to be based on what previously has been found in the county. Other good places to learn more about this kind of information is, and I haven't been able to uh, avail myself of these programs yet, but there is a um, Florida Nat Master Naturalist Program, which I've heard uh, a lot about, which teaches people about uh, habitats and conservation. Uh, and it's similar to the um, Master Gardener Program that's been around for a lot longer, but it's offered at different times in, in different places throughout the state. The Florida Native Plant Society, I'm a member of the Saracenia chapter, which uh, covers Franklin County in its service area. And the meetings are held in Wakulla at the library. The group has field trips and uh, newsletter and sponsors lectures. It has the statewide annual meeting and there's gonna be a regional meeting held uh, in our area uh, next month. So I recommend uh, joining this group. And then of course, there are the Apalachicola Reserve Program talks and uh, habitat workshops. My husband, Tom and I took this Apalachicola River and Floodplains Program um, a couple of years ago, and it was fantastic. It teaches free, register for it. It teaches you about the ecology and culture of the um, Apalachicola River and its floodplains. And then you actually get to take a trip on a boat up to see what you've just been learning about in kind of a classroom setting. So with that, I'm going to close and say that I like to think about the the biodiversity of the Forgotten Coast, it's neither gone right, nor forgotten. And so it's something that we all ought to, to treasure and learn more about and appreciate. And uh, along those lines, I'll give um, one brief um, plug to a small group of folks that I've been working with. We have been trying to, along the lines of helping to promote um, understanding and appreciation of the biodiversity here, and also the important historic contributions of um, Dr. Chapman from Apalachicola. We've been working to try to get more Chapman-associated plants plants he named or plants named after him, um, present at the um, Chapman Botanical Gardens in Apalachicola. So if that's an effort that you're interested in being a part of, please contact me. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to finish up and say thank you and um, see if anyone has any comments. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and we'll leave your your email up there in case somebody wants to join in the efforts to restore the Chapman Gardens. Um, Alicia, you want to come on camera? I, I forgot to introduce Alicia Bruno. She's our producer. And she's going to handle the questions. If we have anybody, if we have any hands raised, any questions in the chat? Jenna has her hand raised. Okay, Jenna, you want to come off mute? Or do we have to take her off? Yeah, she's off. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for that talk. It was fantastic. Um, and um, one of the things I, I love most about the side cafes is that we keep all of the presentations on our website and I get to direct people to them all the time. So I am so glad to have this one as another one in our library to share with people. Um, so my question is, um, 
in thinking about future biodiversity with climate change, um, there's obviously so many factors leading to our high biodiversity. There's the, the, ge the geography and there's species ranges and there's all the environmental conditions and the, the local habitat conditions. Um, what, what do you think is going to be the biggest driver? And do you think that, um, you know, some of these, obviously, like range, exp some of the ranges are expanding north and some are expanding, you know, maybe east or west. Um, what do you think is going to be, like, let me ask you, what do you think the biggest constraint is going to be going forward that's going to reduce biodiversity? Yeah, yeah that's a, that's a, very interesting question, Jenna. And I, uh, I know for in the Midwest, which is where uh, more of my recent research experiences, there's been a lot of concern about needing to have migration corridors again for species and you know even plants, <laughs> plants that migrate. Even though it's like, how far did that seed blow from the tree before it started to grow, and is it? as um, optimal climate for species changes, uh, the thought is that, that you know it will be drier and warmer and species, say in Indiana, that are in the southern part will uh, in the future grow better in the northern part. And so they would, in order to keep them from um, going extinct in the state or extirpated, they would need uh, migration corridors so that there's not just um, un in unhospitable habitat like farm fields uh, and so there's been a lot of effort to try to link up nature preserves so that um, species can have some uh, natural area to migrate through and when I think about the Franklin County uh, area I don't know. I, you would probably know more about what well, obviously you would know more about this than me but as you know it seems as if there's a lot more contiguous habitat that would facilitate um, some species migration there. I don't know if that answers the question or not. No, it's just I mean, uh, it's kind of an open-ended, you know. Yeah, I would be happy to hear what what other people think about that. <laughs> I think you're I think you're right with the with the geography and the habitats. We do have a lot of open ground that um, migration is maybe one of our strong suits um and so i don't know i kind of i kind of think about um maybe future like climatic events if we have um you know like higher annual precipitation or if we have you know something that you know changes the environment dramatically um or the conditions let me say the conditions um maybe that is going to have more of a limiting factor than you know the the actual physical um you know whether you know they're in like a, a steep head up in torea or something you know maybe right. they can they can they can survive in the steep head but then if the you know the groundwater changes or something maybe that's something that's gonna drive that loss so but thank you i appreciate it so much Sure, thank you. Do we have any more questions, Alicia? I'm not seeing any come through yet. Okay, we'll give that a few more minutes in the, but uh, while we're seeing if anybody wants to say anything else, I wanted to um, thank Rebecca for, for uh, giving this wonderful talk and I, Put in the chat some of the resources you mentioned, the um, Florida Plant Atlas, the Florida Natural, um, the FNPS website, and then the natural Florida Natural Inventories, Area Inventories. Right. That quite right. And then I put our the Research Reserves website with a link to where this recording and other Sci Cafe recordings are. So um, if we don't have any other questions. Um, so thank Anita, you. For, uh -huh. Anita, I'm just going to give you a chance to um, to 
plug your uh, Bay Friendly Landscaping class. There was one, I think, just before this, which allows yeah. people to experience some of this biodiversity right in your own yard. So. Yes, we, and it, it's very important. You know, I've heard a lot of rumblings through through uh, websites and emails about Hurricane Ian wiped out a lot of uh, native plants species and now is an important migration time. So uh, I know people are trying to, to plant native plants to serve that purpose because um, some species don't eat plants that we buy at Lowe's and, and hardware stores. So it's important to put some natives out there. And yes, thank you for mentioning our class. We just had one today and it's, it's all about how to really live with the nature around here rather than fighting it because you'll lose, I can guarantee you. <laughs> it's just a little brutal when it comes to environment and growing things here. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we, yeah, we, we have that class. Big, we witnessed that with Big Freeze this winter too. Yes, we did. We found out what plant zones are. <laughs> <laughs> and we found out how much we really think we can overcome them and we really can't. So that and drought and heat and salt. So yeah, if, if anybody's interested, that class is taught regularly and you can find it on our website. I did want to um, quickly, before we sign off, ask uh, see, to let you know that we have another Sci Cafe on uh, May 25th, three to four, and it's going to be a preliminary assessment of water flows through the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway and the Gulf County Canal. Um, there's a lot of thought. Uh, if you've been upriver, there is um, Lake Wimico and water uh, passes to the west of us as well as to the east of us. So there's actually been uh, some instrumentation installed. I think it's been there for over a year now. And uh, Dr. Paul Thurman with the Florida Northwest, uh, the Northwest Florida Water Management District will be giving us those preliminary results. So um, please join us again for other lectures. It is the third Thursday of the month generally, and uh, we are happy to have you. And Rebecca's husband will be speaking in June. He's uh, a noted fungi expert. So, And I have a lot of fun calling me a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the pun. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us. And okay, thank you, you next everyone. time. Okay, bye.